Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Is it all right? Julian just lent me his, his space shuttle over there. Which if you can get someone to loan you a space shuttle, you're having a pretty good day. Uh, I, I flew the space shuttle twice. Uh, uh, I flew on, on a crew that flew on Atlantis, and then I flew on a crew that flew on Endeavour. And, and then on my third space flight, I flew the, the Russian spaceship, the Soyuz. Um, and the whole experience, I'm just going to put it right here, if that's okay, Julian, and we'll, I'll give it back to you at the end, okay? Okay. Um, Julian wore his astronaut jacket today. So, uh, so I thought maybe uh, I'd just tell you what it's like to, to launch a spaceship and, and to fly one, to be on board. And then um, I'm happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about. But, and then we can open up to questions uh, after that if, that, if that's all right. Um, so this is an amazing thing, the space shuttle. I mean, what, a, what an incredible idea to be able to take seven people and 60,000 pounds of stuff and get it to orbit, and not just get to orbit, but then bring it back and land it smoothly on a runway. What an incredibly complicated task. The most complicated flying machine ever built. The most uh, capable flying machine ever built. And, and one of the most dangerous flying machines ever built. So in order to fly one of these, uh, you really want to get people that know what they're doing. And, and so I first decided to be an astronaut before this was ever invented, of course. I decided to be an astronaut when I was uh, almost a little older than Julian, when I was nine years old, is when I, how old are you, Julian? He's four and a half. So when I was twice your age, I, I decided to be an astronaut. And, and then I just started getting myself ready. And 26 years later, I was sitting in Atlantis on the launch pad in Florida getting ready to go. And you lay on your back to, uh, to fly in space. Because it's going to be a long, heavy acceleration. And if you were just sitting like you folks are, if you were going to space that way, then of course it, it would be like some big hand pushing the blood down to your feet. And you could probably stay awake, but you'd have to work at it after a while. And in a lot of airplanes, we sit like that because you have to look outside. But in a spaceship, you don't have to look outside during launch. There's not much to see after about 30 seconds because you're going straight up. So therefore, we can compromise in a spaceship and lie on our back. So that way, the acceleration doesn't drain the blood out of your head. It just pushes it to the back of your body. So, so we lay on our back, and we have since Al Shepard and Yuri Gagarin went up. So you crawl into this ship. The door is right over here. And the, the ship is sitting like that. So it's kind of weird because everything's... <laughs> like if, if you went out to your car in the parking lot when you got out there it was sitting like that it would be weird to get in you know you'd open the back door and you'd sort of crawl in and stand on the back window and then you'd have to worm your way up and get in to sit on the chair and that's what it's like getting into the shuttle you worm your way in and stand on the back window and clamber your way up to get into your chair but you're not dressed like like that in your NASA shirt you're wearing you're wearing a space suit a big heavy, uncomfortable space that weighs almost as much as you do. And there are about 500 switches in the cockpit of the shuttle. And you're, you're trying not to bump one as you crawl in. Because <laughs> if you bump one, you die. So you don't want to bump a switch on the way in. So you are very carefully crawl in. There are four people upstairs, three people downstairs, the flight deck and the mid deck. Get yourself strapped into your chair. You're laying on your back. There's these windows across the front, and then there's two little windows on the top. And, um, and someone closes the hatch and you start getting ready to go. And it's weird because this is something you have prepared for your whole life. And now it's actually happening. You know, you, you almost have to convince yourself that this isn't just a drill today, that this isn't just one more simulation. You're actually leaving Earth today. And you're about, in the next nine minutes, you're going to take an enormous risk. But it's a risk that you have dealt with 15 years previous. Because, I mean, how do you face danger in life, right? How, how do you personally choose to do something risky? Um, I, I, I'm not a thrill seeker at all. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I would never take a risk for, for no good reason. I'd never bungee jump. 
To me, that's crazy. I mean, a bag of sugar can bungee jump as well as I can. You know, there's, there's no skill and only risk. So I just, I just don't see any reason. But this is worth it to me. And so I decided way early on that this is a risk I'm going to take. So then I'd spent years and in decades, in fact, getting ready for this moment. The clock ticks down in the cockpit, getting closer and closer. And about five minutes before launch, we power up the, the seat right here, throws three switches. Uh, the guy, person who's in the pilot seat throws three switches. And that powers up the hydraulics. And the whole vehicle kind of pulses underneath you. And then three and a half minutes before launch, it moves these big engines around on the back and the big elevate and the elevons and the rudders. And because they're big and, and um, heavy, when they swing around, the whole vehicle kind of moves underneath you like it's uh, like it's a living beast, like you're like a dragon that's waking up that you're sitting inside of. And and then about uh, 30 seconds before launch, everything's ready to go. And you, the, the preparation is unfathomable. We've cleared a section of the Atlantic where the solid rockets are gonna go into. We've cleared a section of the Pacific where the external tank is gonna go into. We have pilots flying approaches at runways in Spain and France and Northern Africa, just in case during launch, one of these engines quits and we can't quite make it all the way to space so we can just immediately go and land over in Zaragoza, Spain or, or uh, East in France or somewhere. So there's astronauts over there flying approaches just so they can give you an accurate report on whether it's suitable landing weather for a space shuttle. The, the preparation is beyond belief, and the clock's ticking. And 15 seconds before launch, there are these big sparklers go at the back, and that's just because this is hydrogen oxygen powered, and if you have a little bubble of hydrogen at the back, you don't want to light it all at once or it'll kind of go woof, and, and you might um, blow out one of your engine bells. So these sparklers go just to burn off any stray hydrogen, and then six seconds before launch, we light these three engines in the back. You're strapped to these huge solids that are, that you're, that are here, but these engines start applying force here, so it's not up the middle. So it's like some giant with a crowbar is prying on your structure from off center, and the whole thing bends forward. And because you're sitting up here, you feel it like, like a sway down towards your, your feet. It's weird, and NASA calls it the twang, because you twang forward until the whole thing kind of creaks. This is with one and a half million pounds of thrust pouring out the back. Whole thing kind of creaks over as far as the metal will let it, and then like a big tuning fork, it comes springing back to vertical, and at the second it hits T0, the huge solid white rockets light, you go from one and a half million pounds of thrust to seven million pounds of thrust. Ooh. Now you got enough power. And it cuts eight <laughs> huge bolts. These bolts are uh, the four inch bolts, and there's eight of them, great gigantic nuts on them, have, um, have pyrotechnics in them that cut all eight of the bolts, and suddenly you're released from the ground, and you go. And, and by the time you clear the, the tower, here, you can be the tower here. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you clear the, actually the tower is out the commander's window. By the time you clear the, the, the tower, you're going 100 miles an hour, straight up, accelerating. Right up the and Yeah, straight up. And by the time you go through, in 45 seconds, up about 20,000 feet, you go through the speed of sound, straight up, accelerating. I mean, the, the power is unbelievable. It's like 80 million horsepower. It, we burn fuel, like this is fuel, we burn fuel at, 12 tons a second at liftoff. Wow. It's just, it is raw, ugly, stupid, brute force. That's the only way, that's the best way we know how. It's re eventually we'll figure out some much more elegant way. We'll look back on this and go, what were we thinking? What a crazy idea. Like looking at the Wright brothers plane, you go, they got the tail on the wrong side. What are they thinking, idiots? We'll look back on this the same way. But for now, it was it's the best design ever. And, and, uh, 70 seconds, you're higher and faster than the Concorde, and you are just getting pummeled inside. You're squished into your chair. Those big white solid <coughs> rockets um, are super violent burning. They're not smooth burning at all. They're just a huge semi-contained explosion that's going on for two minutes. And you can't even, you can't throttle them or shut them off or, or jettison them. They're just, they're, you're just strapped to two gigantic Roman candles is all they are. And they're, uh, they're just getting you above the air as quick as they can. And they, after two minutes, you're um, 165,000 feet, six and a half times the speed of sound, but you're above the air. And those solids explode off and fall down into the Atlantic. And now it's just this strapped to its great big gas tank. 
this is now a gas tank, and it is strapped to its gas tank, and, and now you're just pumping hydrogen and oxygen, and we got jet engines in here that just raise the pressure enough to be able to feed the rockets so we can generate enough thrust, and you're draining this fuel out of this huge gas tank, and it suddenly gets smooth because you're not burning on the solid rockets anymore. So now suddenly you go from like, like you've been uh, driving across a plowed field to suddenly dead smooth. And, but it's just getting heavier and heavier because you start accelerating so hard that it, uh, it just squishes you down into your seat until you're, you're like pushing your lungs forward to breathe. And, um, and it, eventually you're accelerating so fast because you burn up most of your fuel so you're light. Now it, it would actually rip up the vehicle. It can't stand all the strain. So then we actually take the throttles or the computers do if they're working right and we walk the throttles back to idle just to keep the vehicle from tearing itself in half. That's how much power there is until finally after from from when you were sitting there just thinking about what you're going to do next until eight minutes and 42 seconds you're exactly at the right altitude and you're exactly the right direction and the right speed and the engine shut off and you're weightless amazing ride if, if you get a chance i really recommend it. <laughs> go for such a ride eight minutes and 42 seconds and that's just how space flight starts. You know, that's just the very beginning. And, and on my last flight, I, then I was up in space for five months after that, went around the world uh, 2,300 times. And all told, I've, between the three space, I served with the NASA astronaut office for 21 years and flew three times. I have about uh, six months in space and um, I helped build the Russian space station Mir and then I helped build the International Space Station and did two spacewalks and then I lived on the ISS and, uh, and commanded it while I was up there for the last few months. And all told about 2,600 times around the world. And um, can I borrow your book for a second? And then back about 15 years ago, I was thinking, you know, I speak at schools and businesses and the, all over, United Nations, everywhere, about space flight, but also about what's, why, why fly in space? Why? You know, why do we do this? What's, been, what's interesting out of it? What's useful out of it? You know, obviously there's some technical stuff that's useful. There's a lot of scientific stuff that's useful. Uh, we're understanding the world a tremendously more clear way because of our ability to see the whole thing in 92 minutes. It's really hard to make conclusions about the health of the world if you just stand here in the Salt River Valley, you know? <laughs> you, you don't draw good conclusions about the whole world by looking at the weather in Phoenix. And, and, and it's true everywhere. But we can go around the world every 92 minutes. So we release a lot of satellites and we do a lot of work from the shuttle or, or now from the space station, understanding the world. But also, what I ended up talking about a lot was what's useful as a person? How do you get yourself ready to do that? How do you separate fear and danger in your life? You know, how do you not let fear dictate what you're going to do with your whole life? You know, it's easiest just to say, oh, I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of, you know, fill in the blank. I'm afraid of flying. Okay, you're afraid of flying. So you'll never go anywhere except someplace you can get to on four wheels or two wheels. That's, that's okay, but that's a tremendous limitation in life driven by fear when in fact, what's the actual danger that you're afraid of? And the, the necessity to figure out how to separate danger from fear. Or how to, how to drive yourself, since I was Julian's age, or a little older, towards a goal that'll probably never happen, and yet stay happy and optimistic about it. Conduct an interesting and productive life when you're pursuing a dream that will probably never happen. And, and so I'd spoken about those for years, and about 15 years ago I started laying out the idea that maybe I should write those ideas down. And then my wife and I were out walking the dogs about five years ago, and uh, we, we have two dogs. Um, one's a Maltese, who's pretty smart, well-behaved. We have a pug, who's just a moron. He's a delightful little <laughs> pug. Pugs aren't smart, they aren't supposed to be. And he went running off across the park like he does, and my wife went running off after, after Albert, and, uh, and I was standing there with Jack, and we were thinking, and, uh, and I thought, I think I'll call the book An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, because that's where it only really matters. The best we can be in space is entertaining, but what really matters is, is what are we doing up there that is useful? to people to think about and, and maybe to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And this book is uh, my best effort at that. 
And it, the book in the hardback version, which has been out for 18 months, it's in 20 languages already all around the world. It's used in schools and um, uh, a lot of ministers use it as the basis for a series of sermons, which I never intended. <laughs> I, I would just caution you that at some point your life may become the, the basis of a system of sermons, which, so live your life accordingly. <laughs> Try not to be a bad example. Um, and so, uh, and then I did a second book um, of, uh, of images because I wanted people to see the world for what it truly looks like. And um, I'm really delighted how this book uh, has been received around the world. People, I wrote it to be useful, and I, I'm glad that people find it that way. And uh, it's, it's all over the world. And, and uh, now that it's in paperback, which is really nice, is that it's being bought by like grade eight schools as their classes as their uh, you know as a study book at kids that age and for for a lot of different applications so so I'm delighted to see it, to see it uh, having some utility and um, it's probably enough I think what I'll do is I'll open it up for Q and A thank you for the use of your book sir and um, I'll open it up if anybody has any questions and we'll just we'll talk Q and A for a little while and. Uh, um, you may inspire me to think of another story or something. Yes, ma'am. Um, how many G's do you feel on liftoff? How many G's do you feel on liftoff? So F equals MA, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. Yeah. The force is just what's ever pouring out the back. And so then your acceleration, which is the G's you're going to feel, it depends on your mass because the force stays the same. So as you burn off fuel at 12 tons a second, then your mass is dropping. So F equals MA. Your F is steady. So... Uh, therefore, your acceleration is climbing. And as, as you burn off fuel, it gets heavier and heavier. You feel more and more G. Until we get to a limit, as I say, and then we decrease the force by bringing the throttles back. So the limit that the shuttle was built for is 3G. It's only 3G. Three times your force. So if you weigh, whatever, 150 pounds, you weigh 450 pounds uh, sitting in there. Which doesn't sound so bad, but after a while, you know, if you're not used to weighing 450 pounds, it's a lot, you know? And the worst part is you're not used to having, you're wearing clothes that weigh almost as much as you do. And, and what you're laying on is not, is not a posturepedic. You're laying on your, on your, you know, parachute and your survival equipment. And your. it's funny, when you're laying on your back, some guys had lower back pain because we're a bunch of old fighter pilots. And, um, and so they put this little lumbar pad in there and they gave you a little squeezy thing to inflate your lumbar pad. So you're laying on the pad, and you go, oh, I forgot, I have a lumber pad. So you blow up your little lumber pad, and you go, hmm, oh. and you let the air out of it. And then you do that like three or four times, and then you go, oh, it was useless. But it's kind of a funny little thing, somebody's idea. But um, so uh, the shuttle maximum was three and a half. Uh, any more than three and a half, and it's not structurally designed for it. So when they set the, uh, the, the whole put together... Um, combined engineering design of it. Three and a half G was the design limit, and so we limit ourselves to three. But if you just have two or three, no, three people of equivalent weight to you lie on top of you for eight minutes and 42 seconds, you'll see that after a while it's, it's not great, you know. You're happy that it's only three G. Yes, what's your question? Same question again? Same question again, please. feel when you have no oxygen space? What's your name? Jacob asked me a question about uh, how does it feel to have no oxygen in space? Uh, the inside of the spaceship is like a balloon. <clears throat> you know, it's, it, you're living inside a bubble of oxygen. So when you're, when you're up in space, it, whether it's inside the space shuttle, this is now a space station, or if you're inside the space station, um, it's, uh, you're in a big bubble of oxygen, just like this is a bubble of water. And so you're fine inside. But if you want to go outside, then there's absolutely nothing outside the spaceship. It is, it's not just there's no oxygen, there's no nothing. It's completely, uh, we, you call it a vacuum which basically is just a complete emptiness. And so if you and I went outside, we would want to be wearing one of these spacesuits, like in that picture in front of you there. You'd want to be wearing a spacesuit because it holds a bubble of oxygen around you. If we just went straight outside, dressed like we are right now, it would be really bad. <laughs> want me to tell you what would happen? Yeah. Well, the first thing that would happen would be your lungs would collapse. 
because there's no oxygen or air to inflate your lungs. There's no pressure. So your lungs would just go huh, collapse. And so then there'd be no oxygen getting into your heart. And so you'd be starting to die because you'd have no oxygen. And then there's no air around you. So anywhere on your body that's a little bit wet, like your eyes or your tongue or your armpits or whatever, they'd boil. So your eyeballs would boil and your tongue would boil. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And then, um, you know when you open a can of Coke, uh, it kind of goes and hisses and fizzes. And if you look at the Coke, it gets a bunch of little bubbles in it. That's because it's going, it's high pressure inside the can. And as soon as you open it, you're opening it to sort of low pressure. And so all that gas bubbles out of the Coke. Well, if you were in, go outside with just your body, your blood would do the same thing. And your blood would suddenly fill up with little bubbles. And that wouldn't be good for you either. So it would be a race between the boiling eyeballs and the collapsed lungs and the bubbling blood as to which one would kill you. But it wouldn't take very long. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, you'd have you'd have a few seconds of consciousness and that's all. So we don't go outside naked ever. We always wear a spacesuit. And then and then of course every ship that comes up to the space station, uh, it brings new oxygen, a little bit of new oxygen with it so that we can constantly re have enough oxygen inside the spaceship. Yes, sir. Where were you uh, during the Columbia accident and what role did you play in the aftermath? Where was I during the Columbia accident and what role did I play in the aftermath? Uh, I was uh, NASA's director of operations in Russia for a couple years and I'd been in Moscow steady for two years and I came back to the United States on January 30th, I think, or 31st and I woke up in the morning of, uh, uh, to watch Columbia come apart during entry. I, I just, just got back. So I was in Houston. And uh, I, Rick Husband, who was a commander of Columbia, and I were at test pilot school together. We were test pilot school classmates up at Edwards in the Air Force. And I'd known him you know, a bunch of my adult life, and great guy. He's a, he put his way through Texas Tech as a singing waiter. You know? wow. Really nice guy and a uh, family guy, really active in his church, great guy. And, and um, he and his whole crew were killed really brutally, you know, because uh, the left wing burned off because we had damaged the leading edge and we didn't know. And so as they came into the atmosphere and the vehicle took all that heat, it was like a big blowtorch melting the left wing off. And of course, as soon as the wing structurally failed, the vehicle stopped being aerodynamic and then just came all apart structurally and, and it just, uh, disintegrated and so the crew was essentially you know beaten to death awful way to die and um, and so imagine how all of us felt we we knew there'd been a problem with that ship but we didn't we didn't work hard enough on it and we maybe could have done something about it maybe but we just you know it's not a perfect business flying in space anything worth doing has risk and sometimes you get it wrong you know and as a test pilot, I lost one good friend a year. It, we expect our yeah. test pilots to die on a regular basis. It doesn't make the news at all. Test pilots die all the time, and you, you never hear about it, because they're supposed to. That's part of the job. Um, but astronauts aren't supposed to. I'm not sure why, but we're not supposed to die. And so it made a huge impact across the world. And within the office, of course, I went in that morning into the office and tried to be of some use and help out. And, and there were people dispatching down to go across Nacogdoches and all the way across the East to pick up all the pieces. And we found all their bodies and you know, it was just awful. Um, but I, I knew Rick's family, you know, and so I went over and I spent time helping them. That's, that's what I did for the time after the, after the accident. But then I was chief of robotics after that. And in order to fly this thing again, we had to fix three things. We had to stop damaging it during launch. We had to be able to detect what the damage was if we did damage it during launch. And then we had to be able to repair the damage. We had three things we had to be able to do before we could ever be trusted to fly on behalf of everybody ever again. And so as chief of robotics for the astronaut program, my job was in detection by using the big robot arms to look everywhere to see if there's any damage. And then of course in repair, like a big cherry picker, to put an astronaut out to go repair anything that got damaged. And so I worked really hard for the next two years with the team of people helping to do all the design necessary so that we could safely fly again. And we could have quit easily. There's lots of people thought we should have quit, just like after Challenger. But I looked at it from Rick's point of view. If it had been me on this thing, 
and someone said, hey, you're going to die on this next launch, and if you die afterwards, we're all going to all quit and go home. I would have said, what? I'm, I'm taking the risk, not you. And if, we, if I die, what I expect you to do is, is figure out why and make that never happen again and build a better vehicle and move on. That's what we should do. And, and obviously, that's what Rick and the crew would have thought. And so it never occurred to us. And fortunately, everybody agreed. Enough people agreed. And uh, they trusted us to fly again. It took almost three years till the next flight. But we got our act together. We flew a quarter of the whole shuttle program after that. And we resolved to finish building the space station. So in 2004, we said, we're going to retire the shuttle in 2010, and by then we need to finish building the space station. And we, we had to go a little bit into 2011. But basically, we followed our own timeline. Didn't hurt one more person. And uh, finished building the space station. An enormous success story um, built on the, uh, on the loss of the crew of Challenger and Columbia. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. The interior looks really battered. Is that the rocks and things in space that hit the, hit the shuttle and uh, leave those impressions? Yeah, the question, I don't know if you all heard, but he's, the, there are some of the shuttles in museums right now. One of them's out in L.A., and they all look about the same. They all look beat up. Well, it's because they are. I mean, they, they were beat up. They flew uh, dozens of times in space. And when you're coming back into the atmosphere, it's 3,000 degrees on the outside. So you end up with scorching the outside. And, and, and when it sits on the pad in Florida, you know, you, you build everything, you put it, you mount it and everything, you drive it out to the pad. It sits on the pad for a month and a half sometimes before launch, getting everything ready. So, you know, there's woodpeckers attacking it and, and weather. And, you know, if, if you put anything out there for a month and a half, 30 times, you know, that's a lot of just weather exposure. And then, um, we do get little micrometeorite dings in it every time, but a lot of it is just during ascent, we get up to, you know, 500 knots. So, so imagine a hurricane of 500 mile an hour winds pushing over your vehicle. So it messes stuff up a little bit. And then during entry, we get up to about 320 knots. So that mars things up. So it's really just regular wear and tear. Very few of the dings that you saw came from meteorites or, or from uh, debris. Almost all of them are just from just rough wear and tear of flying up through the atmosphere and down through the atmosphere. And, and also, a lot of the exterior is not hard, smooth metal like, like you know, on uh, US Air or something here. It's fabric. Okay. And we, there's, it was so cool at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, there was an entire uh, room full of seamstresses. And all they did was sew fabric for spaceships. It's a really interesting room to walk into. Wow. All these, they were all women, and they were all sewing machines, and 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 they sew spaceships together in there. It's just not what you expect to see. And if you're a male astronaut walking in in a flight suit, it's kind of a fun place to walk into as well, because you cause a ripple as you walk in. But um, but it, it's uh, so the fact that it's covered in fabric means that it also looks bad over time. You know, there's fabric that's been exposed to the environment for 30 years, almost always looks pretty weathered. So, uh, so that's why. But, but the structurally, they were all sound. And uh, when we retired them all, they were still, I mean, they're really complicated to maintain, but, um, but still viable flying machines. Yes? Are your muscles weak or strong in space? Are my muscles weak? What, what's your name? Xander. 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 Xander asked if my muscles are weak or strong in space. Actually, Xander, can you come up here and help me answer? Would you, would you mind? <laughs> Can you stand up on the table? Are you brave enough to stand on the table where people can see you? Just climb up there where people can see. We'll discuss muscles, okay? Just stand there where people can see you, okay? All right, this is Xander. Give Xander a hand. So Xander's body, how old is Xander? Six. Six. Xander's six. Xander's got a cool shirt on. He's here with his mom. And um, Xander's body is designed for Earth. It's a pretty interesting design. Um, I mean, look where Xander's eyeballs are. They're, it's kind of crazy, but they're way up here. I mean, all of your, your delicate organs that keep this body functioning are all inside Xander's torso, inside a big protective rib cage, protected by bone. But for some reason, uh, his eyeballs and his brain are up here. 
It seems like a dumb design, right? Why would we do that? And it, it's just because for a long, long time, if you want to see danger coming, you want to have your, the thing that detects danger as high up as possible. So you can see the danger in the distance. So Xander has his ears and his eyeballs way up, jacked up high on the body design. And that's nice, but his brain should be down inside next to his heart and his liver and his kidneys, right? But the trouble is the optic nerve has so much information going through it that you can't make an optic nerve that's a foot long because it would, uh, it, there's too much time lag. So you need a short optic nerve. So therefore the brain needs to be up here. Plus here, turn your head, just your head, look around. Plus, you got to mount it on a swivel, right? You want your eyeballs to be... Go ahead, turn your head around. Yeah, you want, you, want a, you want an articulating device to move your eyeballs and ears around. So if I make a noise over here, he can tell where it is and look at it. Go ahead, look at it. There. So, Sandra, you're doing great. So, um, so, it's a, it, so we decided by, by just sort of basic human body design that the brain and the eyeballs and the ears need to be way up here. But you pay a huge price for that because you got to build a big... Uh, uh, crash helmet for the brain, which is our skull, and that's heavy, you know, there's a lot of weight up there. So you, then you need to here, turn around so everybody can see your back, if you don't mind, Xander. So now you need to build this whole complicated skeleton just to be able to hold this head up here, and, and, and all of the structure, and then, and then you don't want to be stuck like a plant in one place, so you need this whole mobility system to move it all around. It's really complicated, and, and you pay a price also because um, the blood wants to all go down to Xander's feet, and so it constantly, like a conveyor belt, has to lift the blood all the way up because the brain and the eyeballs need a lot of blood and oxygen. So you've got this conveyor belt going, and, and turn back again, please. You're doing great, by the way. And, in, and his heart over here on the left side is just working all the time, like a big conveyor belt, getting the blood up to his head. So all of that, and the reason I mention that, is designed for gravity. And the second Xander, Xander, do you want to fly in space? The second Xander flies in space, the design is completely wrong. There's no up or down anymore. The danger does not come over the horizon the same. You'll be upside down. There is no up or down, there, there's, by definition. So um, your eyes don't need to be on top, but you're floating all over the place. So the fundamental design is wrong. And gravity is not pushing your blood to your feet anymore. So you don't need this big, heavy, active heart. And you don't have to hold your head up. He does not have to uh, raise a finger for six months, <laughs> literally. Don't have to lift a finger for six months. His neck just becomes a pointing mechanism. It doesn't have to hold the weight. So he could be the laziest Xander in the world and, and never use his muscles for anything except just pushing off the wall and floating around. And that'd be okay if Xander never came back to Earth again, but his mom would be sad. So if he's gonna come back, then he needs to come back to Earth, where his muscles have sort of wasted away, his cardiovascular system is sort of shut down, and his balance system is shut down. And so we could do nothing, Xander, for the whole time in space, but when we got back, we'd be weak, and we'd, we'd, we'd fall down all the time, and our bones would be weak. And if you just tripped, you'd break your hips or your legs. So on the space station, we exercise two hours every day. We have uh, a big resistive exercise machine, sort of like a Bowflex, and we have a big treadmill that we run on, and we put big elastics around our waist and our shoulders to hold you down on the treadmill so you can run on it. And then we have an, a stationary bicycle. Uh, the stationary bicycle doesn't have a seat, right? <laughs> you don't need a seat. And you get a bicycle once around the world. It's like no big deal. And, uh, <laughs> And so, Xander, I exercise two hours every day. And when I, here, make a muscle. Let me see your muscle. Go ahead, make a muscle. There we go. And so, when I came back, because I was having a healthy diet up there and I worked out two hours a day, I actually was 20% stronger. My muscles were stronger when I came back than when I launched. And there was no beer and no pizza up there. And so, I, I lost about 20% fat. So I came back kind of ripped, it was great. And, uh, but my bones, okay, you can stop. But my bones were still, I still lost, I kept the bone density everywhere except across my hips. And I lost about 8% of the bone across my hip cradle and my upper femur because we, our exercise equipment isn't good enough yet. But eventually it will be, we're almost there. We started out with 
uh, an exercise device, and then a re so it was Ed, and then it was resistive exercise device, which was red, and then it was the improved resistive exercise <laughs> device, which was I red. What we have up now is A red, which is the advanced resistive <laughs> exercise device. But as soon as we get the, I don't know, the perfect resistive exercise, the pred, then, um, then we will return to Earth basically uh, at least as strong as we left. And for you to go to Mars and, or even to the moon, we need good exercise equipment. Thank you. Oh, just a second. Let me see if I have a pen for you, Xander. Nice job, Xander. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any more questions? The far back. Yes, sir, in red. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the question was, what's the relationship between the, the Russians and the Americans and Canadians, everybody? The space station's built by 15 countries, um, which is really weird to have 15 countries doing something <clears throat> together. And, and we've been doing it for over a quarter century. And there's always at least two of those countries that aren't getting along somewhere, right? <laughs> like Canada and the U.S., we're arguing about softwoods, and we're arguing about fisheries. And, and you know, there's always something. And uh, who has a better hockey team? We're always arguing. Hey. No real argument, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, but you know what's interesting about it is uh, it sort of rises above that. And uh, I, I used to be a fighter pilot. I flew F 18s in the Air Force in Canada, and then I flew F-18s as a test pilot with the Navy at Pax River. And I used to intercept Soviet bombers off the East Coast that were practicing cruise missile launches on North America. In the 80s, I would scramble in the middle of the night with a fully armed F-18, race out over the Atlantic, and intercept an armed Soviet bomber that was practicing to see how vulnerable we were to, vulnerable we were to cruise missile attack. That's what I did in the 80s. In 1995, I flew on an American spaceship with a Russian payload in the back and used the big Canadian arm to help build the Russian space station Mir, just eight years later. And that's better, actually. You know, that's a better thing to be doing. But it doesn't eliminate problems on Earth by any means. But if you can give people a little higher purpose and a common enemy, and in our case, the common enemy is complexity and cost, and the common purpose is trying to understand the rest of the universe, then it brings out the best. And even though the stuff that's going on between Russia and the US, well, really Russia and the world right now, is just Russia's, their politics are just a scourge on the world. They have been for a thousand years. But that doesn't mean that everything is bad, you know? And I think a symbol like the space station, you can watch it go over here at dusk. It's the brightest star in the sky. I think having a symbol like that is more important now than ever. And, and the beauty of it is any kid in the world, whether, whether it's Xander or whoever, can walk outside and look up and see an undeniable example of what we do together when we do things right. And I think that's a really worthwhile thing. And so there's, you know, there's political argument back and forth, but at, at the working level within the space agencies, our arguments are technical. And, and, our, and on board, there are no arguments. We're all just part of the crew. I was the commander of the world spaceship. And some of my crew was from Russia, and some from Belarusia, and some from the US, and you know Japan, and whatever. And uh, we're just trying to help explore the rest of the universe. And yeah, you look down at the world and go, yeah, yeah, whatever. You, know? um, you tend to get, I think, a more useful, um, and sustainable understanding of the world itself when you see it every 92 minutes. And, and that's part of the reason I wrote that book and the reason I did the second book was to try and let people actually see the world for what it is. Because so many of us think that our little square of pavement or sand or whatever it is, is the only part of it that really matters and everybody else is wrong. And um, and that's, that's crazy when we're, you know, we're, we're all breathing out of the same bubble, you know? It's like we're all buddy breathing off the same scuba tank. And, and we just tend to lose sight of that sometimes. Hmm. Yes, sir. Just one question. I saw on the news that this 
Soviets want to build their own space shuttle in 2027. So what is that going to do with the international? question is, he saw in the news that the Soviets want to build their own space shuttle in 2027. So any sentence that starts with, I saw on the news, <laughs> I would really be suspicious of. Do not ever use a single source of information to conclude that it's right or wrong, <clears throat> especially the news. Well, I mean, being a news person is, is miserable. You have to sell stuff every single day. You have to keep people from changing the channel every single day. And you're doing your best to have good integrity, but there's such an onslaught and so much competition. It's not an unbiased educational reflection of what's going on around the world. It's just another form of entertainment. And, and so, and also the Russians, what actually happened was last month, even though the United States and all the other countries are opposed to what Russia is doing in the Crimea and, and, um, and the Ukraine, the Russians just signed up and committed to another four years of the International Space Station. They're, they committed until 2024, in amongst all of this. So to me, that's reality. They signed up to do that. Now, uh, then in order to save face, they said, but after 2024, we're going to undock and leave. No, they're not. <laughs> they need to save face, you know, but they recognize that what's going on up there is precious and complicated and really hard won. And so, if any, and especially if someone's saying, in 2030, I'm going to do this, who's going to remember in 2030 what you said in 2015? That's just, that's just talk. So, I think the reality is to look at what we've done and what we're doing now, and, and the fact that right now, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko are up there for a year on the space station. There's an American on the spaceship. That's the first time ever. Scott's a really sharp test pilot, Navy guy from, uh, from New Jersey, really good guy. And, and uh, what's really happening is two representatives from Earth are doing groundbreaking research and what it's going to be like to explore the rest of the universe in person. That's actually what's going on. And what, what part-time politicians in Russia say to the news on a weekly basis is kind of irrelevant. Maybe one or two more questions, and then uh, then I'll start saying yes, ma'am, right there. Um, you said that you had your you discovered your dream when you were nine. So for the kids that are here, maybe a little bit about kind of what your childhood was like and how you prepared as a kid at the same spectrum. So the question was, I decided uh, to be an astronaut when I was nine. You said discovered my dream, which is maybe the same thing, but I, when I was nine years old, and so what was that like, and what was my childhood like? I, I grew up on a farm. And, um, and I was in Canada. When I was nine, there was no astronaut program in Canada. But the reason I was nine, or maybe the reason it happened when I was nine, is it was the summer of 69. And on July 20th, two people walked on the moon. And I'd been watching Star Trek and, and reading Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein and Bradbury. And, and I'd watched two, uh, Arth, Arth, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And they, those were just kind of like expanding my little boy mind into things. They weren't that far off from Batman and Superman. They were just fiction and fantasy. But all of a sudden, for real, people actually flew in space. And they walked on the moon um, on July of 69. And so it suddenly was evident to me that impossible things happen. And they happen sometimes because they just barely can't. And they happen because a lot of people work really hard to make them happen. And so for a little kid, to me, that was just like somebody saying, the door's open. It's up to you whether you go through it or not. And, and Canada had no astronaut program. Now, I hear a lot of people telling me, well, I, you know, I couldn't be an astronaut because they weren't accepting whatever my subset of humanity was at that time. And people still say it right now. But... What I know for sure is that impossible things happen and things change constantly. And the only thing you really control is yourself and, and the decisions you make on a daily basis. So nine years old, I'm like, man, I want to be Neil Armstrong. That's the coolest thing ever. What do I do next? And I had no idea. But I, I just sort of gave myself a long-term goal of I want to walk on the moon. That's what I want to do. Xander, I wanted to walk on the moon. Okay, so... I'm only nine. I can't walk in the moon yet. I don't know anything yet. What should, you know, I need to learn some stuff. And so I use that through my whole childhood and really ever since as a long-term goal to allow me to choose what to do next. 
And, you know, what, well, okay, I, I want to walk in the moon, so what should I do this weekend? Well, what book should I read? I mean, we're in a bookstore. If you want to walk in the moon, there's a lot of information in this room that tells you things you need to know. You need to understand how spacesuits work. You need to understand how your muscles need to be. You need to know what, what's moon dust made of. It's like ground up broken glass. You need to, I mean, the, there's unlimited stuff to know, and you need to say, okay, I want to walk in the moon. They're probably not going to hire astronauts who don't fit in their spacesuits, so I need to take care of my body. And and I, it just gave me a um, uh, a framework to make decisions. And I think maybe the key of it though was, uh, I never said to myself, if I don't walk on the moon, I'm a failure. Never. I said to myself instead, someday if everything goes perfectly, I'm going to walk on the moon. But meanwhile, I'm going to do some interesting stuff. And I'm going to try and move my life closer and closer and closer to maybe walking on the moon someday. And I still haven't walked on the moon. Big fat loser. I mean, like, <laughs> but, but, but I, I don't view myself that way because I try and, and feel like a winner every single day. I, and I mean, this morning I woke up on time. My alarm worked. I didn't miss what I was doing. I exercised this morning. It is gorgeous here in Arizona in the morning. It's beautiful. I mean, I'm from Canada. You got great weather here in the morning. I feel like, feel like I'd won the lottery looking at the weather out the window. And uh, I had a nice breakfast. And somebody's really, you know, those scrambled eggs, if they make them kind of fluffy, they're just delicious. Put a little pepper on those. By like 8 o'clock in the morning, like, victory! What a great day! You know? And, and it, it's just, I just treat every day like that. And I flew in space three times. And so, but I, it's not like my life was terrible and I managed to salvage something worthwhile by flying in space. I, I try and come to treat life entirely differently. And that is allow myself to celebrate the victory of the joyful things that are happening every single day and constantly try and become better at things that allow me to do the stuff that are important to me. And that's just how I conduct my life all the time. And, uh, and so, same thing for, for any of the young people here. You're, he, people ask kids all the time, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? And you're like, I don't even know what the choices are. That's an unfair <laughs> question. So here's what I'd recommend. When you walk into Barnes & Noble, I bet you you don't go to every single section and read every single book the same. You, you know, here's the fiction and literature section, and over there is the mystery section and poetry and, and college and planning and Shakespeare. I, nobody in this crowd treats every single shelf the same. Everybody here, if you just walk into a bookstore, you go to the section that's interesting to you, or maybe the two or three sections that's interesting to you. Do yourself the favor of noticing which sections of the bookstore you go to, because that's who you are. That's actually what's in your heart. That's what you're interested in. And so say to yourself, you know what I'm really interested in is Shakespeare. That guy, he, he invented how to express yourself. He understood the human condition better than anybody. I love reading Shakespeare. And then say, huh, I'm a person who loves Shakespeare. I didn't realize that about myself. So if I'm a person who loves Shakespeare, what should I do with my life? What would be the ultimate dream job for me if, if if I know that that's who I like. Well, shoot, I'd love to be an English professor at university teaching Shakespeare. Or I want to be on Broadway playing King Lear or, or Henry V or something. That's what I want to be. And then start making decisions that move your life that way. And, and if you don't end up being Kenneth Branagh, it doesn't matter. You will have spent a life learning more about something that you love. And it's okay to change your mind, too. But what I would really recommend is that you don't just let life choose for you. I mean, you make choices every single day, and those choices are the ones that actually turn you into who you're going to be. And, and so do it deliberately. And so I've conducted my whole life. Yes, sir. Thanks. It's nice. Very, very Thank you. Good. Yes, sir. What's my view about aliens? Uh, <laughs> See my mother in law. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's see. I, no astronaut has ever seen an alien. All right? I just want to say that up front. I mean, and people say to me, oh, they make you say that. No, nobody makes me say that. Um, and, 
And you know, I, it just makes me laugh. I see on the internet, there's a picture of the space station and someone sees like some weird reflection of light and they go, look, aliens are docking with the space station. I'm going, no, I lived there. Aliens are not docking with the space station. I mean, really? Um, so, but we used to think we were the center of the universe. I mean, just uh, not that long ago. I mean, if you walk outside, is that? The universe revolves around us. That satisfies our ego really well. But then when Galileo um, got one of the first telescopes and looked at Saturn, and he noticed that Saturn had moons going around it, it's like it had a big question mark over his head going, wait a minute, if there are moons going around Saturn, they're not going around us. The whole universe doesn't revolve around us. And he was tortured for, for saying that because we really wanted to be the center of the universe. But as every single telescope got better, we realized just how much the universe does not rotate around us and how insignificant we are. And recently, with the best of our telescopes, we can start to see uh, planets around other stars. And we're, in fact, getting to the point now where we know that every single star, on average, has at least one planet. Every star in the sky has at least one planet. We're directly observing that. And the stars are bright enough that we can count them. And we know, using the Hubble telescope and others, that when you count it up, uh, our best estimate is there are about seven septillion stars. Septillion is a big number. It's like, you know, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, septillion. And, and we aren't even capable of thinking of a number that big. It means nothing to me. It's such a big number. But the odds are seven septillion to one that we're not alone in the universe. So I, the odds are that we're not alone. But we can't understand big numbers, and we can't understand time. The universe has been here 13 and a half billion years. You know, we think a weekend can be pretty long sometimes. 17, you know, 13 billion years. So, and the distances are enormous, so it's really hard to get an actual perspective of where we are in the universe. Um, so I think it, it's extremely unlikely that we're alone in the universe, but we also have found no evidence of it. But we're looking. On Mars, just yesterday or two days ago, they announced um, there's liquid water on the surface of Mars. Liquid water on the surface. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system. And on uh, Ceres, which is the biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt, we just started orbiting it about a month ago, um, we think it is more fresh water than Earth does. And uh, Enceladus, which is orbiting Saturn, um, we just, this last, two weeks ago, we found that it is it has water geysers that are spurting from Enceladus, and that feeds one of the rings of Saturn. That's why one of the rings of Saturn exists, because this little, um, planetoid has enough heat and enough water that the geysers are squirting out into space. And any place on Earth that has heat and water has life. I mean, look under your sink. You know, there's, there's life anywhere. So, so maybe there's life in our solar system apart from here. And if we can find it on Mars or Enceladus or Ceres or somewhere, then we know the universe is full of life. But every time you see something you don't understand, to me, I don't go, I don't understand what that is. Therefore, it has to be intelligent life from another galaxy. That's a bit of a leap with absolutely no justification. So, so I would just ask people to, rather than believe, to understand. Rather than just blindly believing something, to actually do the research and think and study and see what makes the most sense and look for evidence-based conclusions. And hopefully we're not alone. If we are alone, then we, we, we have a real responsibility. If we're the only life in the universe, then we, need to, we should do a better job of it. I think. Anyway, are we about out of time? Okay.